good morning. It is me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. It's very early in the morning, and I hope you guys are ready for, I think, uh, a really exciting mission. This is one that I have been looking forward to for a long time. And as a matter of fact, I realized literally, this is my this is my one mess up for the day. You guys know I have mess ups every time I stream. I realized I didn't change the title to say that this is Watch Rocket Lab Try and Recover an Electron Rocket from space because these are exciting missions so i'm changing that right now this is this is one to be excited about this is a really big deal rocket lab is working on recovering their electron which i think you guys hopefully know about but in case you don't know about that there's a little website you can go to anytime you have any questions about upcoming rocket launches and in this case uh you can just go to this little website called everydayastronaut.com and you guys can go uh, right on over to everydayastronaut.com, click on the upcoming launches, and you can see a list of upcoming. Look at how filled out this thing is. Our our website is getting better and better with more and more articles. Thank you so much to our awesome web crew. This Today's mission is called Running Out of Toes, and that's uh, we'll get to that in a second. We'll see. I'll explain exactly why it's called uh, Running Out of Toes, because there's been some people that are like, why did they name it Running Out of Toes? Okay, so anyway. This is going to be taking off today, May 15th. It has moved. Uh, the official current net time is uh, is in 23 minutes. So it's actually at like uh, my time. It's like 5.08 or something in the morning. Uh, but yeah, it's it's like 10.08 UTC, I believe. Uh, the mission name, this is Running Out of Toes. And it's two Earth observation microsatellites for Black Skies Constellation. The reason it's called Running Out of Toes is this is their 20th launch so of course if you are counting uh launches by with your with your fingers and then you know you run out of fingers then you end up counting on your toes um you know most of us hopefully have around 20 digits so uh it's kind of the end of your counting uh yeah so mission name running out of toes the launch provider is rocket lab the customer who's paying for this is space flight um incorporated and then they so they kind of it's this weird thing space flight basically like is, is like the broker. They like help book these flights. So it's technically paid for. Ooh, guys, this is some good news. We already have the uh, the Rocket Lab live stream is getting ready to go here. So um, let's let's uh, let me get ready to click on over here real quick. Give me one second, and I'm gonna get that halfway pull up and ready to go. They they went on nice and early. Um, let me make sure. Hold on. We're gonna go 1080. Of course, we don't want 720. 720 in the morning. Ugh. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, let's uh, let's get back to our pre-launch preview while we wait for them. We'll have them uh, ready to be pulled up, hopefully, by the time we're done with this pre-launch preview, and we'll be ready to go. Okay, so um, this is... Uh, let's see. Okay, so Space Flight Inc. is kind of like p penning all the paper and doing all the stuff and, and organizing these, these launches for Black Sky. Uh, ro the rocket is the Electron, which is currently the only rocket that, uh, that Rocket Lab is flying, despite the fact that they are working on a new rocket, which is really exciting. The launch location, of course, is Launch Complex 1A in the, in the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. This is currently their only launch site that they fly from, even though they do have the one out at Wallops, it's ready to go, it is active. Um, and they also are almost done, I think, with Launch Complex 1B, which is also out on the Mahia Peninsula. The payload mass for this is 120 kilograms. Uh, it's actually a pair of satellites. So um, that's pre they're pretty small. Obviously, each one's less than 60 kilograms or so. Uh, where are these satellites going? They're going to a 430-kilometer circular low Earth orbit uh, at a 50-degree inclination. Uh, will they be attempting to recover the first stage? Yes, this will be their second attempt at, at trying to recover a booster, which is extremely exciting. Of course, if you guys need to know how they're trying to do that, uh, I have a couple of videos that talk about exactly how they plan to catch their rockets with a helicopter. Uh, which is nuts. They're they're using a parachute. They're doing a lot of things that uh, that people kind of ask. You know, why doesn't SpaceX use a parachute? Or why don't you know? People still ask that on Starship. Why isn't SpaceX using a parachute on Starship? Uh, you know, of course, I've covered that in, in a video about you know why does space why does Starship belly flop? Uh, but as far as this actually goes, uh, you know, I've got a, a two or th two videos specifically about why the Electron is able to be caught under parachutes. One's an interview with Peter Beck, the CEO, and another one is an, is an in-depth rundown on kind of the, the mass, the the velocities, and all the reasons that they can actually um, do that. So yeah, check those out if you have questions. Uh, okay, so anyway, this is uh, do, 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 do. Uh, they will be attempting to, it'll be attempting to splash down about 650 kilometers downrange from the launch pad. Uh, so about 400 miles or so. 
a little more than that. Will this be? Will they be attempting to recover the fairings? No, this is not a capability of Electron, so they are brand new fairings. The weather, um, they were talking on Twitter a little bit about some, uh, they were kind of looking out for upper level winds, but the fact that the webcast went live is a good sign that hopefully they are proceeding for today's launch. This will be the 20th Electron launch, the third Rocket Lab launch of 2021, second planned Ocean Splash on Recovery mission, the 42nd orbital launch attempt of 2021. So Mary Liz from Cosmic Perspective will be very excited. <laughs> that is the 42nd. She loves anything that's 42. Uh, and then, yeah, so if you guys want a, a more of a rundown on this exact mission and even a little bit about, um, you know, about the the Black Sky Constellation, things like that, go ahead and check out our awesome pre-launch preview. Uh, there's just a lot more information here. If you guys have any other questions about how they're going to do this, some of the some of the graphics and stuff like that, and even an exact timeline on some of the events, including the stage one recovery and all this stuff too. So it's, it's super awesome. A really, really good in-depth rundown for you guys. Hopefully that will help answer any remaining questions. And we need to give a shout out to one of our new authors today, Maria, who wrote this article. So everyone say thank you to Maria for an awesome job on her inaugural article. It was, it was uh, very impressive. We're really, really excited that she is writing for us now. So yeah, good morning, everybody. Let me get the the stream pulled up here and ready to go because I am I'm ready for this one. I hope this one is just going to go off right away first thing in the morning. That would be awesome for me and awesome for you guys. I would love to, you know, what's that called? Um, sleep at some point. Yeah, that's that's what that's called. Okay, let me get that out of the way. Okay, here we go. Now we have this ready to go, so we won't miss a single second. All right, so let's get to a couple questions from you guys here before uh, before we get started. First off, thank you, Ron, for the membership. I really appreciate that. And Musical Wolves, as always, how are you, my friend? Do airplane lights get added to make nighttime booster recovery easier? Uh, hope to not miss SN15 reflight. We'll, uh, we'll be on a trip between the 23rd and 30th. I hope not either. I, I, don't, I have no idea the sense of the timeline for SN15. You know, we just... I'm guessing they're going to want to look at that booster pretty heavily, honestly, or the, you know, the Starship uh, pretty heavily before they refly it. I'm not sure, honestly, what uh, what all will entail, how long that'll take. Um, I hope it's not this month, to be honest. I, I I would love to not have to zip back down there right away, back down to Boca Chica. But um, as far as do they make airplane lights or light, lights for it, I don't know if there's going to be lights. Uh, they Yeah, that's a very good question. It would make it. I mean, that would definitely aid in it quite a bit. So, all right. Uh, let's see. That's that's a very good question. All right. Let's see. This is from uh, Garrett. Uh, I want to thank all the Everyday Astronaut crew for making all these gorgeous streams and all the other videos. Well, thank you so much, Garrett. Don't forget, guys, if you guys have good YouTube questions or good questions, you can just make sure and pop them over there. Just, just in regular YouTube. We don't have to do super chats or anything like that. Just ask a good question, and hopefully one of our mods will catch it and get it in front of my attention, and I'll push that on air if we see it. But... Uh, Let's see here. I'm going to be, um, yes, this is a great point, Rick. I hope they talk about this. Um, they're going to be doing an interesting stacking arrangement. The two satellites are literally on top of each other, kind of like how the Ariane 5 has this cool payload adapter. I hope they talk about that because I would like to listen in um, because it's a really cool way to encapsulate two payloads. So these two satellites are literally just like, yeah, on top of each other, uh, almost like with a mini fairing in between them. It's, it's, it's a really cool idea. Um, I'm glad to see them doing that this time around. But let's go ahead and listen in here this morning, and uh, and we'll get back to your guys' questions and stuff as soon as we can. Hello and welcome to the launch broadcast for Rocket Lab's 20th Electron mission, Running Out of Toes. Electron is fueled and ready for liftoff from Rocket Lab's Pad A at Launch Complex 1 in Mahia on New Zealand's east coast. My name is Muriel Baker and I'm here at Rocket Lab's Mission Control Centre in Auckland, New Zealand, where I'll be taking you through the launch of this dedicated mission for Earth monitoring company Black Sky. It is close to 10pm on Saturday, May 15th. This mission has a window of approximately two hours and we're expecting to launch right at the top of that window at 10.08pm New Zealand local time. Our launch operations team are not working any issues, and with greens across the board, we're well set for an on-time launch. 
Running out of toes is a significant mission for the team here at Rocket Lab as our next major recovery test. For only the second time ever, we will attempt to bring Electron's first stage back to Earth under a parachute and splash it down gently in the ocean as part of our efforts to make Electron the world's first reusable small launch vehicle. Our recovery team is currently stationed in the Pacific Ocean waiting for Electron splashdown so they can retrieve it and bring it back to our factory for inspection. However, weather conditions have deter deteriorated significantly in the splashdown zone, which means we have limited live communications with the recovery team. Visibility at sea is also greatly reduced, so it may take some time to provide confirmation of a successful splashdown, and we may not get this during the webcast. Nonetheless, conditions are optimal for launch, so we are proceeding with the count. Today's recovery attempt will follow a pretty similar process to our first recovery attempt six months ago on our return to sender mission in November. But here's what's new for this mission. We've strengthened Electron's thermal protection system with an upgraded heat shield to help protect the booster's Rutherford engines. We've also refined our retrieval logistics and introduced the ocean recovery and capture apparatus, otherwise known as ORCA, to our recovery vessel. This hydraulic cradle is essentially a reco recovery optimized strongback to help safely bring Electron aboard. But maybe most excitingly for this mission is the fact that we'll be flying previously used components for the very first time. Electron returned in such good condition during the return to sender mission that we're reusing its propellant press system on this one. Now with the recovery team out at sea patiently waiting for liftoff, let's take a look at what's involved in the recovery process. At approximately two and a half minutes after liftoff, at around an altitude of 80 kilometers, Electron's first and second stages will separate. Electron's second stage will continue this mission's journey to orbit before the kick stage separates to deploy the satellites. Now this is part of a standard mission profile, but next is where it gets interesting for recovery. During its descent, Electron will reach around eight times the speed of sound and the air around Electron will heat up to 2,400 degrees Celsius, generating an extremely hot plasma that creates a red-orange glow around the re-entering stage. To help Electron survive this brutal experience, a reaction control system on the first stage will orient the stage 180 degrees to place it on an ideal angle for atmospheric re-entry. From hypersonic speed, we decelerate the first stage to below Mark II before a drogue parachute is released to increase the vehicle's drag and help stabilize it. In the final kilometers of re-entry, a main parachute will be deployed to further slow the stage and enable a controlled splashdown. Our team on the recovery vessel will then rendezvous with the stage and bring it on board the ship with Orca before transporting it back to our production complex for inspection. For tonight's recovery attempt, we'll have cameras on board Electron's first stage feeding us live footage, and we'll stick to those views as long as we can, but seeing as it's a night launch, our views will be limited by the lack of sunlight. We're also expecting to lose the camera view during a telemetry switch between our ground tracking stations, and due to poor weather in the splashdown area, we may not get real-time comms from the recovery team during the webcast. We'll listen out for the calls, of course, but if we don't get them live, we'll share updates on our social media channels to keep you posted on Electron's return to Earth. I just love how the rocket ends up uh, covered in ice right now. So even though it's a black rocket, I love that it's white when it's on. It's like a reverse Falcon 9 right now. I think that's just like the funniest thing ever. So you do see that it's, it's very cold. You can see the condensation. Uh, kind of coming off of it. you see those little clouds of condensation uh, again that's because you can that is where the, you can tell where the liquid uh, oxygen tanks are on this rocket by which parts of it are pure white um, the inner stage there is is in between some of those but the parts that are uh, look like there's fog coming off of it that is where the liquid oxygen We're tanks approaching are. t minus 12 minutes in the count and soon our operators will be run through the go no go poll by this mission's launch director, Sean DeMello. Let's listen in to Mission Control and check how we're tracking for launch. Yeah, let's do it. Maybe. All stations, LDN mission, proceeding with a go-no-go -no -go sequence at this time. 
Looking for your status, how to proceed for launch. Stage? Stage is go. Avionics? Avionics is go. GNC? GNC is go. Vcon? Vcon is go. T1? T1 is go. GC? GC is go. PLS? PLS is go. RSO? RSO is go. Met? Met is go. Mission management? MM is go. Recovery? Recovery is go. LD sub. LD sub go. Executive. Executive is go. Gonna go sequence complete. Uh, we are at 11 minutes, 12 seconds and counting. We're go for terminal count start at T minus 10 minutes. From this point on, the three word hold procedure is in effect. There you have it. That's confirmation from Mission Control that all systems are go and we'll be proceeding with the remainder of the count. Liftoff remains scheduled for 10.08pm New Zealand local time or 10.08am UTC. Now to this launch's primary mission objective. Running Out of Toes is our third mission for 2021 and the first of several dedicated launches this year for Black Sky, which provides geospatial intelligence and global monitoring services through their low Earth orbit constellation. Electron will be launching two of these satellites at a 50 degree inclination from Launch Complex 1 and deploying them to a 430 kilometre orbit. Once in space, these Gen 2 satellites will mean Black Sky can better deliver insights to decision makers, responding to disasters or tracking economic activity across the globe. Here's more from Black Sky. I really want to see if they actually talk about the fact that they're going to be stacking these satellites because it is really cool how they're doing it. You know, obviously ride sharing with, with rockets is pretty new. Uh, and so, I mean, so is stacking satellites, but it's cool to see the little Electron carrying two pretty good sized uh, things so I think that's super super cool. Um, I did want to get to a couple uh, a couple questions here while we have a chance because this is uh, there's no vo voices on this. So um, for uh, from Moreno says, um, do you have any insight when Rocket Lab will do the technical presentation about Neutron? Uh, no. When I spoke to Peter Beck last time, he just kept mentioning soon. Uh, you know, if if that's I don't Peter Beck ends up having tip typically has not quite uh, Elon Musk's timelines so when he says soon it tends to be i feel like that's normally like a month or two so i would expect uh relatively soon to be able to actually get some kind of update from them um on their upcoming neutron rocket which i'm extremely excited about that's that's something that i'm yeah if you don't know what what the neutron's all about um i did have an interview with their ceo peter beck about a month ago uh look here on my youtube channel or watch the, the and or watch the video uh, kind of teasing the neutron. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be kind of a Falcon Nine class rocket with propulsive landing. He keep he kept teasing that they're going to be doing some cool, unique things that are never seen before. So I'm excited to see what those are because they definitely have some cool ideas. Um, I personally feel like uh, Rocket Lab is just they just come up with these really unique solutions to things. So uh, another quick one here from. Uh, from Vignesh says, uh, "Hey Tim, how is your video on the Russian rockets coming up?" So uh, I've mentioned it a few times on air, a few times on air that uh, we're going to be taking this one to the next level, and quite literally to the next level. We're going to actually be shooting uh, that entire video about the entire history and timeline and family tree of Soviet and Russian rocket engines in Russia. I just think that's going to be the best way to do it and make a proper documentary. Services provider Spaceflight Inc. The first was Make It Rain in June 2019, followed with our second two months later on our Look Ma No Hands mission. The third Black Sky launch on Electron was this year on our They Go Up So Fast rideshare mission in March. Tonight's mission is part of an overall deal to deploy nine Black Sky satellites across five Electron missions this year that delivers them the rapid launch capability they need to expand their constellation quickly. So I do have a couple of people asking, of course, the important question, and that is, is the pointy end up and is the flaming end down? The orientation check. Uh, to be perfectly honest, from from this is kind of hard to see. I hope they give us another camera view, one that has the, uh, there we go. Okay, that one, I can do my confirmation check. Um, with that view, I, I do want to confirm that the pointy end is up and the flaming end is down and that Electron is go for launch. It is, you just see that big chunk of ice fall off that is, that helps you understand just how cold this thing is. You know, uh, liquid oxygen, oxygen turns into a liquid, I believe at like minus 183 degrees Celsius. Um, so it's very cold. I mean, the fuel on board the rocket 
or at least the oxidizer is extremely cold. Uh, it's just kind of fun to think about that. So um, this is a great question um, from Prashant says, uh, Tim, what what is your take on Aldrin cyclers? Do they really save that much Delta V from Mars missions when compared to direct insertion through the Hohmann transfer? So the big deal about For an the Aldrin team here cy- at Rocket Lab, mm-hmm. this mission also marks a couple of fantastic achievements because tonight's launch will be the 20th time Electron leaves the pad powered by our 200th Rutherford engine. It's incredible to think that we've built, tested, and fired 200 of our unique 3D printed electric pump fed engines. Rutherford is the world's first 3D printed orbital rocket engine, a unique design that went against the grain of traditional rocket propulsion systems when we first introduced the idea. Rutherford also made space travel electric by replacing the traditional gas generator cycle with electric pumps powered by lithium polymer batteries. This mission is one for the history books, so we sat down with some of the team who helped make it happen to talk through their experiences of our first 20 electron launches. What we have here is just uh, a completely you know, defiant group of people who, who really want to execute and, and see things succeed. It never gets old, whether it's the first flight to orbit or the 20th, whether it's our first customer or our 200th, uh, we're learning something every single time. I mean, I'd been here for five months. We didn't know if it was going to work. It's mainly getting the customer's payload into space. It's game time. Launch day is space Super Bowl, right? I don't even remember breathing, <laughs> but it was worth it. it. Was It's a feeling you just can't describe. You just have to really be there. I'm much more interested in the payload these days. So for the first few flights, it was all about the rocket. As now, I get to know a little bit more about who we're launching. Launch day is way harder than I thought it was going to be. I thought by the time you get to 20 launches or some number, it would just be like, you know, making coffee. Everybody's just so invested in each launch that there's always, there's always so much energy around each launch. Hearing that um, our first light satellites come alive and things like that is, yeah, it's a totally different feeling than just we've launched this rocket and that's been awesome. 20 missions is a huge achievement um, and that's been incredibly exciting, but I'm even more pumped for the next 20. So I'm super stoked about recovery uh, from the quality engineering perspective. I like the fact that you get to, to launch the next. It means that you've done your job right. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally we must have a really good design. The fact that we can launch this many rockets, it actually must, Electron's a good product. Rocket Lab's secret sauce is its engineer's dedication to rapid development. We would not have been successful had it been a different group of people. Smiles all around. I can't wait to get back to answering that question about Aldrin cyclers, to be honest. I think I'll be in front of the 20 flights. I love that. Congratulations to every single rocket labber who got us to the pad today and helped us reach these milestones. A check-in on how we're tracking to lift off. The team are working no issues with the launch vehicle. Electron's payload remains healthy and the weather is looking clear for an on-time launch. We're approaching a critical juncture in the lead up to launch now, the switch to the countdown auto sequence. In T-minus two minutes, the autonomous flight computers on Electron will take over the count. At around T-minus one minute 30 seconds, we should hear the call that LOX loading is complete on Electron. And then shortly after that, we can expect confirmation that the launch vehicle's first and second stages are pressurized for launch, followed by the 10 second countdown to liftoff with engine ignition at T minus three seconds. Let's hand over now to Mission Control and listen in for those calls. So uh, we'll keep the calls kind of up. Start at T minus two minutes. Because it's pretty cool, of course. So T minus two minutes, they'll be doing a few more things. But I did want to answer this question really quick, and I do want to get back to that, uh, the Aldrin segment question. Um, Peter B, <laughs> probably not Peter Beck, asks, uh, why is the fuel so cold? Well, in this case, when you say fuel, typically we kind of refer to any of the f- the fuel, the fluids on board as propellant because the fuel is actually at room temperature. It's, it's just RP1. It's basically kerosene. 
um, at, or highly refined jet fuel. And the oxidizer is what's in this case particularly cold, and that is oxygen. Because if you just put gaseous oxygen on board, it'd be almost a thousand times less dense. So you'd have to have tanks that are a thousand times more volume. So the rocket would be huge. Those tanks would be way heavier and bigger. So you chill it down to liquid state. Um, and that makes it so, of course, it's really cold, uh, but that makes it substantially more dense. So your tanks aren't nearly as big and your mass fractions are better. Control in Auckland. Right now, Electron has entered a hold while our operators work on establishing a new T0 time. We'll continue to broadcast while we wait for an update from the team. In the event of an extended hold, we'll provide an update via our social media channels. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with you soon. Well, looks like we're in a little bit of a hold here, my friends. Um, so hopefully, hopefully it's not a long hold, uh, but that's, I guess, why you guys are here, because we can answer some of your questions, including that one that I put up earlier from Subazor. Is this live now? Yes, this is a live. Uh, there are channels out there that'll be like rocket launching live and it's, and they just are replaying. This is actually live, uh, truly. Well, I mean, obviously space time, it's hard to talk about live when you're, you know, this is like seven seconds behind plus another like seven seconds from my end. So it's like 14 seconds from real time. Not bad, but not technically not full blown live. How do you, you know, how, speed of light and stuff? Okay. So I want to uh, go back to pra Prashant's question. Tim, what is your take on Aldrin Cyclers? So Aldrin Cyclers are these um, quite literally named after Buzz Aldrin because Buzz Aldrin pretty much came up with them, who, yes, Buzz actually. Uh, was is brilliant with orbits. He, he created a lot of uh, a lot of the theories and mathematics behind uh, like literally docking and rendezvousing and stuff. He's genius. I mean, I don't think people appreciate just how smart Buzz Aldrin um, is. So um, he came up with this idea of, the, of this Aldrin cycle, which is basically a system that you could you could get a spacecraft into a very cool set of orbits that can pretty much go back and forth between Earth and Mars with very little propellant. And it just kind of cycles, right? Now, as far as saving Delta V, here's the deal. The total Delta V expenditure of that is actually slightly higher because you have to make these little bit little maneuvers. And you still have to get your crew onto the, the vehicle and then off of the vehicle, right? Like, you, it, just because this vehicle is going between Earth and Mars, uh, you actually have to expend the same amount of Delta V to get up to it and probably a little bit more again uh, to actually rendezvous with it. So you're still doing the same amount of energy uh, with with the crews. Now, the, the savings and the cool part of the, the cycler is you could launch, just say, a tiny Dragon capsule and rendezvous with this huge ship, right? So as far as saving Delta V, you can save some some Delta V by by just launching a Falcon 9 and getting a crew to Mars. Now, you know, if you stop and think about that, that that's pretty profound. Because if you think about a big Mars mission, uh, you know, if you think about uh, a mission to Mars, you think about like a Saturn V mega mission, you know, huge super rocket. And then plus another one or another couple and, you know, doing all this crazy stuff and trying to get off to Mars or Starship, you know, and launching... Um, you know, launching many starships and refueling them and then getting off to Mars, right? Um, that's kind of the way that we, uh, you kind of brute force your, your way to Mars. But now if you have a cycler that, you know, needs a, occasionally needs a little bit of topping off and maybe has a high efficient um, ion engine or some kind of other um, electronic drive, uh, they can kind of just stay in the cycling pattern and you can just go and dock with it with a smaller spacecraft. So it, total Delta V savings in the whole thing can be great because you're not having to relaunch your big vehicle that's going between Earth and and Mars constantly. So it's it's a really cool concept, and I I really hope we see stuff like that because that's some of that common sense stuff. It's like yeah, that would make a ton of sense. So we'll see if someday, um, yeah, um, that would be awesome. Uh, from We Tao Tang says, uh, what do you think about Starship going to orbit? Well, uh, it, technicality. It's not quite going to actually. It's not quite going to orbit. It's targeting slightly suborbital, but at orbital velocities, right? Um, so it's going to be going on this big elliptical, um, almost orbit. Uh, and second back to T minus twelve minutes. Uh, we have a hold called for winds aloft or upright winds. Uh, we'll circle back once we've had an opportunity to review the data. Okay, so they're saying they're going to go back about 12 minutes. I'm going to push my clock about 12 minutes back. I should have made my thing says hold. Um, so 12. Oh, it's too early for any kind of math. We're going to just try this. Okay. If you're just joining us, we have entered a hold due to upper level winds and have recycled the clock to T minus 12 minutes. 
We'll stay on the live view of Electron on the pad while the team assesses those wind levels and we'll come back to you with a new T0 as soon as it's confirmed. Alright, luckily we don't have to, uh, we, we're, I'm kind of keeping that clock up a little bit just in case they change it. I forget that with these launches I have to actually do this kind of stuff. Uh, it's different than uh, Starship, you know, where we're kind of guessing. They actually tell us times. That's, isn't that nice? <laughs> Okay, so, um, yeah, and so uh, as far as Starship going to orbit or, or into orbital velocities, it's going to be amazing. I mean, that's going to be a crazy mission to see. Um, now, the, the fun thing to remember here is this likely will be an, an entirely expended rocket. The, the booster sounds like it's splashing down about 20 miles off the coast uh, of Boca Chica or South Padre, you know, right out there. Uh, just off the coast so we will the fun thing is we will get to see it come back down and re-enter and feel that and hear that sonic boom that makes me really really excited um so that's great uh but as far as uh the the upper stage the starship will actually go almost all the way around and end up in hawaii so that's fantastic hand there's a little bit more radio chatter i do want to hear that copy lock stuff up this time I'm sure that locks top up in work. So they're still just kind of topping off their, their liquid oxygen. Because, um, of course, as it boils off, you know, as it's standing there with, with the ambient temperature uh, of the atmosphere, it will warm up. And uh, like we mentioned before, it will um, increase in volume by almost a thousand times. They'll have to vent it out. Um, so they're just going to be kind of continually repressurizing or pressing the, the repellent and, and keeping it topped off inside the tanks. So that's super cool. Um, all right, so yeah, Starship going going nearly orbit or reaching orbital velocity will be awesome. Uh, it, of course, they aren't worried about even attempting to recover it at this point. Really, it is a shame they're going to be throwing away like you know thirty Raptor engines basically, but that's so trivial. I mean, of course, we you know that the thought of that now is cringeworthy, but at the same time, like throughout all of rocket history, that was totally normal, right? That was just absolutely no big deal. Um, but yeah, so it's, it seems like a big deal, but really it's not at all. So, um, it, we'll have to say goodbye to those, those Raptor engines most likely, but, uh, yeah, meanwhile, it'll be an awesome, you know, might as well get that data. We, we got to start, they got to start flying that thing faster and faster and pushing it harder and harder. So we will see. Uh, this is a good question from R6, uh, extra small. Are they using the helicopter? No, not yet. Um, this will be uh, their second attempt to just simply return it and splash it down for now and then actually recover it with their with their ocean vessel uh, that they're calling Orca. And uh, so no helicopter quite yet, but uh, we will see uh, how based on how this goes, if they need to make any new adjustments or changes, then hopefully they will add the helicopter later this year. Um, but we will see. So, you know, I'm going to update my clock just to say uh, holding just so that we don't... Um, so we don't get that. There we go. All right. Hopefully they, oh, they, they did. Okay. They've set the clock at, at, at T minus 12. So hopefully, yeah. Uh, Chris wants to know thoughts on China's lander this morning. So I haven't really caught that. Now that you say, I remember seeing, I fell asleep watching a little bit about it, but I haven't even, I, I forgot it's, hang on. Did, did China make it safely? Like I, I know that was the original speculation. China, uh yeah so apparently it did successfully land so that would make china the second country to actually land on mars successfully if if it's indeed true which it sounds like it is which is amazing that's huge considering that you know russia and the soviet union had had sent so many or formerly the soviet union had sent so many probes uh off to mars and has never successfully actually touched down softly so if they yeah that's amazing that's huge that's that's progress that's it's so good to know that there's finally another country out there besides the united states that can land on mars uh so yeah congratulations china that is awesome um let's see here uh why is starship transported vertically uh that's a good question um i think mostly because it's assembled vertically um in the in the the you know the high bay the the medium bay um, you know, everything's assembled vertically 
And so it's just easy to pick it up with a crane and stick it on something and just roll it out because that's kind of the whole process anyway. It never is horizontal at any point. And even the rings are never horizontal. No, no part of the rocket is ever horizontal until it's flying and falling. Then it's intentionally horizontal for, for a couple minutes. Um, but as far as the other thing, too, to remember is when you go out to Boca Chica and you go down the highway there, to turn into that corner, it's actually really sharp. So if you had the booster or you know the Starship up on its side... Uh, it, it probably it, it couldn't make that turn uh, in particular. I mean, obviously, you could change the road and stuff, but they are limited on the left side of there. Uh, they, they can't go out into the wetlands there. So it would be pretty difficult. 50 meters is is really, really, really long, you know, 165 feet. That's that's pretty big. It, it that becomes a hard thing to, to turn, and the booster is even bigger than that. So, uh, yeah, they. I, I think that's kind of why vertically, because it's, it's assembled vertically, but, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, Ansco. So this is a great question. Won't seawater damage rocket components when it lands in the ocean? The answer is yeah. Um, they aren't necessarily trying to, uh, you know, reuse this yet at this point. They're still just trying to make sure that the recovery methods are, are valid and it's a valid solution for them to be able to actually try to recover the next stage, which is using the helicopter. So, so for now they're not ready to like waste or risk even a pilot's life, you know, with a, with a helicopter, and a falling rocket until they know they have it in a good state. They can do it reliably and safely and accurately. Uh, and at that point, once they have all of the data, all of the stuff, uh, then they will move into the next phase of recovery, which would be uh, trying to catch it out of the sky with a helicopter before it splashes down. Um, and obviously, you can do that because the electron is tiny. Uh, when it's when it's fully dry, it's it's only about a metric ton. Um, so when it's all out of fuel, and that's the fun thing about the electron with electric pump-fed engines is they can actually run the tanks completely dry. Um, a normal, you know, uh, turbo pump engine or uh, like a, you know, closed cycle or open cycle gas gas generator or, um, you know, a, t a traditional cycle type like that, you can't really run the pumps dry or the tanks dry because you'll start to get kind of these bad, uh, bad things that could blow up the engine, right? Where if you start sucking in air bubble or gas bubbles and stuff like that, and the, the electron... The, uh, the, the electric pumps don't care. They're not finicky. They just go, and when it's out, it's, it's just out of fuel. No big deal. Um, so when it comes back in for reentry, it's like pretty much completely empty, which is awesome. Uh, makes it a little bit easier. So, um, oh, this is a good question from, from Ron Gum. Thank you for the super chat. Hey, Tim, love your work. And now uh, you have a new topic to cover now that SN15 landed. What achievement have we unlocked? That's a great question. Um, so I think at this point, SpaceX, you know, they, they unlocked, they unlocked a, probably honestly at this point, just some faith that they're, you know, and, and some feel goodness <laughs> with the people working on Starship that this maneuver is feasible, uh, that, that it's worth them proceeding. Cause at this point you remember, um, Starship's development in particular is a little different from other, and we're kind of seeing this with Rocket Lab right now, actually, as we speak, like I said, we're, they're not trying for the full recovery. They're just kind of going step by step through the recovery process and iterating on that. So once it's, you know, once they know for sure they can safely splash down and, and accurately splash down, then they'll go on to the next phase, which is trying to, you know, eventually try to recover it with a helicopter. Um, Starship uh, is doing something similar where it's, uh, going step by step, right? So, um, now that they unlocked the fact that they that crazy landing maneuver, the the flip maneuver and the belly flop is safe, uh, and they can actually control it and and you know utilize that that sequence, they can go for the next phase. Ooh, we might get an update, maybe. A quick update from Mission Control here. As you can see, we're currently in a hole due to upper level winds. Stick with us as we establish a new T0 time. We'll let you know as soon as that happens. Uh, but today's window remains open until 12.05 a.m. New Zealand time or 12.05 UTC. So we have an hour and 45 minutes left in this window. So we will see, guys. We will see. All right. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, the the achievement they unlocked is... Uh, yeah, is uh, is being able to actually land and, and proceed into trying to now they're worried about how can this thing actually survive reentry. So we're going to have to see them cover, you know, SN20 or whichever one goes to this orbital velocities. Um, they will have to have the entire belly side of it covered in those heat shield tiles. And then we'll see how it holds up. You know, they'll 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 punch it in uh, from from very high, high velocities. 
and see how it holds up. So that's going to be extremely exciting. I, I cannot wait to see the footage from that. Um, ooh, this, I love this question, Razenbot. Uh, what do you think about scalability of Starship? Can it be made even larger? A million percent, yes. Like, that's um, not out of the question at all. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, when, when you when you go back and look at the history of Starship, it has actually kind of shrunk over time to something uh, more manageable. You know, today it's still nine meters wide. That is no joke. That's 30 feet wide. That's still one of the, I mean, it is, it'll be the tallest rocket ever made. Um, and it's almost the widest rocket. You know, the, well, the N1 was insane. Uh, I believe I believe the very base of the N1 was 18 meters wide, um, but then it tapered up, got skinnier and skinnier, and, and it wasn't that tall. I believe it was only 95, only 95 meters tall. Uh, the Saturn V was 10 meters wide at its base um, for the first two stages, and then it tapered in. So I mean, it's 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 up there. But when when it was first officially announced, not just kind of known as the code name, the BFR, or anything like that, um, or the Falcon X that it was sometimes referred to uh, internally as well. Uh, but when it was first announced in 2016 as the um, at uh, as the interplanetary transportation system, it was originally shown as 12 meters wide uh, and about 120 meters tall, if I if I recall correctly. So um, you know, 12 meters was was the original plan. Uh, that would be you know that's that's big. That's a that's a big rocket. Now, um, of course, the cool thing about Starship is it's, it's stainless steel, and it's just it comes in these sheets of rings, so you could easily make larger rings and continue stacking and doing almost the, ins the same manufacturing process they're doing now. Um, it would scale really, really well. And the fun thing is the engines, because they're um, so small and have such a um, have such a, a, a they take up such a small footprint on a vehicle. If you have a, a larger uh, you know, area on the bottom of your rocket, and you can quite literally just add more Raptor engines. So it scales really well in that fact. And and once they kind of know how to do all the reentry and stuff like that, and the dynamics of all that, um, it should scale no problem. So Elon's even talked about that, of course, at nine meters for now. He then mentioned offhand like just eighteen one time, and it's like, okay, why don't we, why don't we go from nine to twelve? But that's the thing. I think they'd rather scale it up. Um, in that sense, and trying to do like a heavy configuration with multiple boosters, uh, like they did with the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, going to that heavy configuration, uh, that ended up being kind of a nightmare. And it's it's actually a lot harder to engineer all the side loads and all these other things for the, the side boosters. Uh, and th at the end of the day, it would have been a lot easier, it sounds like, to just make a bigger rocket, which is exactly what Starship is. And in the same sense, Starship, you could make a bigger Starship a lot easier. Um, hang on. Holding the clock at T minus 12 minutes while the uh, GNC team worked through for the verification of upper air winds and running some worst case data. Expected time to pick up uh, the count is no earlier than 111139 UTC. That's for target T0. I'll report back in about 10 to 15 minutes when we hear back from GNC. 11, so that's near the end of the window. <laughs> Am I gonna be sitting here talking for a full hour? <laughs> oh, I think that's what I, exactly what I'm doing. I think that's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah, one one three nine. Is that what he said? It was the earliest T zero. Okay, hold on. Yeah, that would be an hour and fifteen minutes. Oh man. Um, all right. So uh, yeah, Starship can definitely be scaled up a hundred percent. Well, I'll stick around here and keep answering you guys' questions, of course. Um, who needs sleep, right? <laughs> Civilian dad. Um, am I thinking about a space tourism video? If you had to fund, which company would you ride with? Yeah, space tourism video, it'd probably be high time to do it, frankly. Um, we'll see. Uh, maybe it'd be a good one to, to, to kind of prep and get ready uh, before. I mean, there's a whole slew of new space tourism. Again, don't forget, there. Were, I believe there were eight astronauts that have flown on um, space tourists that flew on... on um, on Soyuz pr uh, previously, but uh, so it's definitely it's nothing new, but uh, we are going to be increasing that. We'll probably see more than eight astronauts fly just this year, likely um, for space tourism, um, orbitally even, and let alone, well, not quite. Well, yeah, it's going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot. Um, in the next year or so, we should see uh, over a dozen uh, space tourists. So. Yeah, and and more more in the tourist kind because the people that rode with Space Adventures and rode on Soyuz, they went through a lot of training and like were pretty much. I mean, could have been professional astronauts, but they uh, paid their way through. So, all right. 
Wait, was it a let? Yeah, I don't remember. We're trying to figure out exactly what time it was. All right, so this is uh, Musical Wolves. Will Rocket Lab be landing uh, on Venus or just orbit? I'm guessing just orbit, you know, and even just dipping into the clouds a little bit would be huge for a data standpoint. Still, there's still, Venus is so underexplored. Um, it could tell us so much, I think, about our own planet uh, just by going and exploring Venus. But uh, getting down to the surface is absolutely insane. It's like being in the bottom of the ocean almost. Uh, of a of an acid ocean, it's really, really, really insanely thick and punishing atmosphere. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't think I haven't heard any plans of them trying to go to the surface. That's just kind of a a nightmare. But I, I think it's going to be an orbiter, from from my understanding. So um, thank you, Animal Raw. Um, from uh, let's see, let's this is a good question from um, Ashan. Says what is delta v? Yes, that is a very important. Um, aerospace term. I probably should have defined that when we were talking about delta V earlier, but delta V means change in velocity. So um, think of it like the range of a car, right? So if you have a vehicle that has a 400 kilometer range, uh, that's kind of like the delta V. It's like how how much can it travel? How far can it, you know, and it doesn't, don't necessarily think of it as far for a rocket, but think about how much can it change direction? So how many times can it, you know, steer around or, or maneuver in space? Um, so, so it's kind of the, the difference between how big are the tanks, how much fuel they have on board, uh, and then how efficient your engines are. But it also has to take into account how heavy uh, whatever it's pushing, too. So it's, you know, if you have a rocket full of fuel um, or, or a heavy payload, that the, or the, sorry, not the rocket full of fuel. If you have a heavy payload, that will change the amount of delta V the rocket has. Um, so a heavy payload, obviously the rocket will have less delta V. It won't be able to go um, into quite as high of an orbit. Um, or reach quite as high velocities. And if it has a, a light payload, it could get into, it could reach higher velocities with that same amount of propellant on board because it's delta V would be higher. So um, yeah, I'll, I need to make a video about just like what is delta V, so. All right. <laughs> oh, Lisa Stojanovsky, famous Lisa Stojanovsky is in our Discord channel. You saw her on the video and you may have also seen her previously on tomorrow, TMRO, one of my absolutely all-time favorite space shows. So, yeah. Uh, quick shout-out to the Discord channel. If you guys want an awesome place to hang out on launch day or any day, uh, a place full of just enthusiastic uh, rocket and aerospace enthusiasts. And, of course, I'll be in there. I'm in there very often uh, working on scripts at the moment. Uh, I'm working on a video about small sat launchers, actually about about small lift launch vehicles like Electron. Comparing it to all the other, we're seeing all these other ones come online, like Virgin Orbit. Uh, Firefly is getting close to uh, to be able to launch soon. Astra's been working on getting to orbit. Uh, we talk about Able. We're going to talk about Relativity, and we're going to actually compare them to the Falcon One, the OG um, commercial small sat launcher. So uh, that's going to be a really fun video. I'm going to have that one out here uh, relatively soon, uh, by the end of the month for sure. And I have to say for sure, because it has to be done by the end of the month. <laughs> no questions asked. So uh, yeah, so that will be uh, that will be what's coming up. So I'm kind of in upcoming in one of our our Discord little rooms there. So if you want to hang out and yeah, kind of get behind the scenes action and just and just hang out with me um, whenever, uh, go to Patreon.com/slash Everyday Astronaut, and that's how you can help support what I do, uh, and also just kind of get some yeah some extra fun bonuses for yourself again that's patreon.com slash everyday astronaut so thank you guys hi discord love you guys uh all right what is the payload for this mission uh ducati uh ducati named uh so let's actually go over here real quick you can see the payloads from our pre-launch preview again this is at everydayastronaut.com and we actually they show uh we have the uh, little picture of the stacking here uh so this is really cool this is the the stacking mechanism this looks so Kerbal Space Program to me because it shows the bolts. As oh. you can see at the bottom right of your screen, we are currently holding at T minus 12 minutes. The team is assessing upper level winds to determine a new T0 for today's liftoff. All other systems remain go though for launch, so it's just a waiting game for those upper level winds. We'll update you as soon as we have a new T0. Yep, so like we said, I think the earliest they can go is in about an hour. Uh, so hope you guys are ready to just sit around and listen to me talk. 
way too much. Okay, so anyway, um, this I love that they show almost like the the nodes, the node points, uh, for like the docking adapter. Uh, yeah, so this is this is Black Sky's two microsatellites on the electron kick stage. You can see there's that cool, um, like cup basically there's a cup so if, if you kind of go right to left or, or yeah right to left like start on the very right here uh you'll see it's empty then you can put the one satellite in there then you put this cup on top of it then you put another one uh, the other satellite on top of there and then you en encapsulate all of that inside the payload fairing that's how they are stacking two of these black sky satellites so there you go i think that's very cool those are the those are the missions uh, or the, the the payloads and uh it's very cool thank you very much thomas um, let's see, <laughs> James, have I named the spacesuit yet? No, uh, those are some pretty good names though, of course. Uh, I, yeah, I, I have not, but maybe I should, maybe I should re name the spacesuit. Uh, that's funny. Animal Raw, um, this is about SpaceX, but do we know if SpaceX uses renewable energy to cool and store propellant before loading, uh, <laughs> with the Bitcoin fiasco? They're working on it. They have a large solar field out at Boca Chica, and they are increasing that thing massively. Um, they are bringing in a lot more renewable energy. I mean, even their, their construction site, we're seeing solar panels pop up everywhere. So they are, and, and the solar field they have is, is pretty massive. Uh, so yeah, they are working on completely sustainable energy out at the, at the site someday. And, you know, even the fact that they're going to be making their own oxygen or separating oxygen from the atmosphere, um, there, and they could run that on renewable energy. It's definitely a good thing. Um, and eventually if they use the Sabatier process to do electrolysis and get their methane by pulling carbon, uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to make methane, then, uh, yeah, if it actually becomes car, it can uh, Starship can become completely carbon neutral. So pretty cool, in my opinion. I like that. All right. Uh, the British Beagle 2 did technically land success successfully. I don't know about that, Carl. There was a British Beagle 2 uh, that landed on Mars, apparently. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Night Fox, uh, Tim, it's been a while. How's it going, Night Fox? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Starship is transported vertically because the rings can't support the horizontal orientation because the steel is so thin. Um, yes and no. Um, don't forget, of course, the vehicle while it's belly flopping, uh, it's under flight pressure when it does that. So um, it can sustain probably higher loads while horizontal. Um, but that's, that's a you know, it probably could be transported horizontally. Um, but yeah, the it, it's... You know, the, the loads are designed to be handling uh, through the vehicle vertically. So, um, yeah, I think with the right support, you know, if you cradle it properly and, and pressurize it enough, um, but, but you can't pressurize it too much when it's transported because, you know, you have to have people around for those operations. But even when the vehicle is is being transported vertically, it's at, you know, just slightly above one bar or, you know, one atmospheric, one unit of atmospheric pressure. Um so, you know, there is a certain amount you can do, but you can't have it too high if you're transporting around people because then it's a, uh, uh, has a lot of energy in there. So, yep. Uh, let's see. The real reason OLF is ending copyright from Rocket Lab's logo. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Our, I, we had almost the exact same thing. You're right. Whoops. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, from, um, Vin Smoke, uh, should they build a s separate private road in Boca Chica for all their transport? Yes, they should, in my opinion. Uh, I think they should build a bypass around, uh, all of their operations and allow the public to still have access to the beach without having to drive past their, and I hate to say it because I love being able to drive past the launch and, and, uh, building facilities, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's safe. I mean, f cars fly down that highway. There's a lot of extra traffic. Um, it feels like the wild, wild west. And of course it's Texas. So, you know, yeah. Um, it, it, I think it, I think they need to have a bypass. So, um, oh, cool. Uh, a New Zealander out there. Thank you so much, Joshua. I'm glad that you're tuning in down there. Um, yeah. Uh, Moss, when do you predict new Glenn will be in service considering how fast SpaceX is iterating? Does Blue Origin stand a chance of competing? So, um, I think New Glenn, I mean, I'm now thinking it's uh, well into 2022 even at this point. It sounds like there's some pretty massive changes. Looks like we might get an update based on the fact that the music just stopped. Maybe. Oh, maybe not. Just switching songs. Um, yeah, I think, so Blue Origins, New Glenn, it's unfortunately been delayed quite a bit. It was supposed to launch in 2019 originally. 
Um, it is it's now pushed into 2022. I think it could easily get pushed into to the end of 2022, but we will see. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like they're making some big changes, and I really hope that those changes speed some things up for them and and get them as far as a chance of competing. Of course, I think I think anyone has a chance of. Uh, you know, yes, SpaceX is is really really advanced right now and really far ahead, uh, but but. You know, it's it's not like it's not worth trying, and and uh, you know, New Glenn when it goes online will be extremely competitive already. Um, you know, it is it's Falcon Heavy class vehicle, so their first orbital rocket is Falcon Heavy class vehicle. You know, three years ago, if it had been online when it was, I mean, or was supposed to be, or say let's just say it went online in 2018 when Falcon Heavy went online, it would they would be two of the most competitive rockets you know ever made in history. So, in the grand scheme of rocketry, three years later is not a big deal, right? Um, it's just we, we're so obsessed with this pace that SpaceX is holding that it's hard to remember that, you know, there's ebbs and flows. And, um, you know, just because, say, you know, Ford made the Model T and, and ramped up mass production of the of the car didn't mean that there's no cars ever to be made ever again, you know? Uh, granted, this is a little bit different, but, um, I th yeah, I, I, it's not too late for any company, in my opinion. So, Yeah. I almost wish that we were just playing Kerbal right now, and I could show you guys the. I, so I'm, when we get to one million subscribers, by the way, which uh, if you if you aren't subscribed, uh, you consider doing that. We are going to be doing a fundraiser when we get to to one million subscribers, and uh, those funds are going to be going to the Challenger Center, which is um, a educational and outreach a STEM STEAM outreach center um, that that does a lot of work with with kids in schools to get them excited about space flight. Um, it's it's uh, in honor of the families, and it was based on. It was started by the families of the crew of the Challengers uh, incident. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a really cool cause. We're going to be doing that through YouTube. So, you know, remember when we had that fiasco with uh, fundraising on YouTube with, with when uh, the last time that uh, Rocket Lab tried to recover an electron, uh, we also decided to stream and and try to point people to those those the other stream because every view that they got, uh, someone was donating a dollar. So that was awesome. But we also raised money. We ended up raising, I believe it was almost $10,000 for uh, uh, the same charity as well. But of course, what we, what we realize is uh, YouTube takes 30% of Super Chat money. So it's uh, so I ended up covering the 30% of the donations just because we realized that in the middle of the stream that, hey, maybe this isn't the best way to use these funds. So instead, when we do the fundraiser here um, for the upcoming stream, sorry, it is with the integration for YouTube. So if you actually have a fund, like if you are planning ahead of time and you submit a proper 5013C, uh, a proper charity like that, they can take the funds and put them directly to them without taking, I don't know if they still take some cut, but um, definitely not the 30% cut. So that'll be good. So we'll be able to raise uh, money for a good cause, in my opinion. Um, obviously, space outreach and education is extremely important. So I'm excited to be doing that. So if you guys haven't hit that subscribe button, um, I, I doubt there's may, very many of you guys out there that um, I feel like you guys are the kind of hardcore. I guess you'd be hardcore if you live in the United States and you're watching this right now. But I guess if you're in Europe or anywhere else in the world, it's normal human hours, probably most likely. So, yeah. Um, what do I think, Joshua uh, Baker? What do I think of Rocket Lab making bigger rockets? I think it's awesome. I think they clearly are... Uh, you know, investing in a growing market with these constellations coming up. Um, having a medium lift lock rocket like that, a six ton capable rocket gets them right in, in line with just about everything, honestly. I mean, that's, that's a, a very competitive area, but if they're working on a, a cheaper and reusable first stage, that's huge. Uh, you know, that they're, they're talking, they're talking big talk here too with it. They're saying they're only going to operate a small fleet of them. Like Peter Beck makes it sound like they're going to only going to want like four of these things ever uh, in their fleet. And they'll just reuse those four over and over. So they obviously have very high hopes of full reusability uh, of their, not full, well, of good rapid reusability of their first stage, which is really exciting to hear. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for the membership from Nat Sun. Um Let's see. Could I see uh, from from Seven Bear Brown um, from South Wales? Hello. Can you see any potential issues from cold welding uh, with Starship in orbit? Um, I don't know enough about cold welding and what it has to do with anything on orbit to answer that question properly. Um, 
Yeah, so the, there was, you know, cryoforming was something that they were doing with, uh, eventually talking about doing with the tanks. They, I don't think they're doing any kind of cryoforming. Um, but Elon had, had talked about that a few times on Twitter, was was cold forming or cold rolling uh, the steel at cryogenic temperatures. Now, I I, I don't know anything about cold welding. Um, and, I, and again, I don't know the effects of said cold welding on orbit. So I can't really speak to that, but that's a good question. Uh, maybe I'll, I'm kind of going to linger on this for a little bit to see if, if anyone in Discord has any um, extra knowledge on that. Um, let's see. Yeah, let me know if you guys know anything. That's not something I'm too familiar with. But um, all right. Uh, ooh, good question. Um from our our nude why are there red parts on this rocket that is signifying that these are the reusable rockets these are the ones that have the recovery hardware they have painted it red and i just think that's cool and i'm glad they did but there's no real i don't think there's any real reason other than it looks cool which is a perfectly valid reason a hundred percent valid reason um this is a, a really good question from Moreno. Says, um, "How do you reignite liquid rocket fueled engine? Isn't the fuel floating around in small bubbles everywhere and hard to catch for the engine?" That is, that is an awesome, awesome question. So, uh, yeah, that's actually something that they have to account for. And you'll notice before a stage lights up, famously, I'm just, you know what? Screw it. We're gonna go on a little adventure here. Give me one second here. Um, we're gonna go. We're gonna we're gonna travel to this website called YouTube. And I want to show you a few things. We'll show you Rocket Lab's stage separation. Another quick update oh. from Rocket Lab Mission Control. We are still sitting tight on the pad, waiting for our upper level winds to fall within bounds for launch. The clock is currently held at T minus 12 minutes. So while we wait for that new T zero, let's take a look back at our first recovery mission back in November last year. Congratulations to the recovery okay. team. This is, team has yeah, this is an old video. We, we've seen this before but it's a really cool video you can find it on their youtube channel um but i want to keep going here looking for uh this stuff in one second so i'm going to look up uh rocket lab stage separation this is one of the coolest videos um i've ever seen honestly so and i'm not saying that lately um okay so check this out here uh transition so this you'll notice something when they push the upper stage we're looking right now sitting inside the inner stage between the first and second stage and you're kind of seeing part of the thermal protective system um, of the the bottom of the second stage and so it's going to be pushed out by some springs quite literally like sp it's spring loaded uh the stage separation unit and so you'll see it get pushed out and then you're going to notice something you're going to notice that there's also some gas thrusters. Do you see that? There's little puffs of gas that are coming from the rocket there. See that? Yep. Right before it lights up and everything. Um, so, and the uh, the other one that's even cooler, in my opinion, is actually, well, not even cooler. I Because, I, like I said, I think that one's really cool. Uh, but let's let's look at the Saturn V stage separation from, st from space. This is one of the most, you know, iconic videos of all time let me see if let me see if this one works um wait okay hold on so you're going to notice something else about this too there's one that shows the the s4b um okay hold on so there's there's these things called ullage motors and they're either cold gas thrusters, they can be solid rocket motors, um, but they fire up before they relight the engines. Okay, so maybe we'll see it in this view. No. Okay, that's not working either. Let's uh, let's find, I think it's the S4B, Saturn V S4B separation. I think this is the shot. Okay, here we go, here we go. This is This is perfect. This is the one I was thinking of. So this is the Saturn V that took humans to the moon. And notice when it's separating, look at those. Do you see those? Uh, there's three jets of, of gas uh, extending. So what that's doing is those are, are separate systems that are that are totally separately pressurized and full tanks. And they just let the valves open and let them rip. And what that's doing is it's accelerating the rocket. So the rocket's basically catching all of, all of the fuel into the bottom of the, of the rocket because it's accelerating. So imagine that all this fluid is basically floating around in here. 
um, and they're all they're all at that point at the exact same velocity. So there's you know no real chance of it you know getting sucked in by the engine properly unless you add some acceleration. So either some solid rocket motors or monoprop or cold gas thrusters, something that's under constant pressure, and you start accelerating it forward, it'll catch all of that liquid fuel and put it into the bottom of the tanks. Um, now uh, we're seeing you know SpaceX have to deal with forces similar to that with Starship. Uh, that's why they have those header tanks during the belly flop maneuver, um, because you know, of course, the, the belly flop maneuver, the you know, you have the 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 fluid, you know, the liquid sitting at the very bottom of the tanks in that case. So, yeah, that's that's a good question. Those those motors are normally called Olage motors, and yeah, that's uh very very cool. Um, okay, so. How did uh, how did Starhopper help in the development of Starship? Great question, the Igloo. Well, it was the first time that they had ever learned how to properly, you know, load um, cryogenic methane and cryogenic, you know, liquid oxygen, of course, uh, into a vehicle and and start up uh, any you know start up the Raptor engine on a rocket that was that was capable of, of moving, right? So they got it. It was just their their first step of getting it off of the test stand. It was pretty much a flying test stand. Is, is all it was. So it taught them a lot about, you know, prop load, um, the quick disconnects and, and some of those systems, um, some of the initial, you know, guidance and startup and throttling of the engine, um, some of the guidance and navigation required to do those maneuvers. It was just a st it was just a simple stepping stone. But I think the best way you can think of it is a flying test stand. Um, and uh, and it and it was awesome. So those of you that don't, that don't remember, SpaceX had this this vehicle before the big Starship uh, prototypes that we've been seeing flying lately. Uh, back in 2019, they had what was called Starhopper, and it was just a teeny tiny little, um, I'll lovingly call it a little trash can, that uh, yeah that that launched successfully. Uh, technically, it hopped three times. Um, uh, a tiny little like one meter hop, a 20 meter hop and a 150 meter hop. So yeah, it was uh, it was very, very, very cool. Um, let's see here. Will Thorpe, will Starship reach terminal velocity uh, coming in at orbital velocity? Will it be uh, going the same speed as SN15 when it lights its engines for the flop? I believe so. Yep. Um, it should reach terminal velocity. That's half of the point of doing that belly flop maneuver is to allow it the the opportunity to get down to terminal velocity. Um, so watch my video about why is SpaceX belly flopping. Uh, we kind of mentioned it near the beginning that that although you know we're just seeing them practice that flip maneuver, that should pretty much be the same from from orbit, and it'll have scrubbed off all of its velocity, all of its additional velocity, uh, before it gets to that point, and will reach that moment of terminal velocity, which is where drag and grab the force of, of drag and the force of gravity are equal. That is. Um, yeah, so that I, I, I'm pretty sure if not, it'll be darn close, you know, it'd be a lot better off than if it was going, uh, you know, nose first or tail first, uh, they should be getting a lot closer to that proper, um, moment of, of terminal velocity that, so, uh, Mark, th uh, think Elon will ever launch a starship with removable fairings to launch a huge amount of Starlink satellites. So I don't think th not for Starlink, it just really does not make any sense for them to, to do like an expended upper stage. Um, if the full, you know, if everything's working properly, why would they do that? Unless, say, they had to send something massive to like the outer solar system. Like, if we wanted to send a, a hundred metric ton uh, orbiting space station out around Jupiter, uh, then yeah, you could actually do an expendable upper stage and not even worry about, um, you know, not even worry about uh, recovering any of the upper stage. And for SpaceX, that'd be cheap, you know. Um, clearly, these prototypes, if you, if you just were worried about having some uh, vacuum optimized Raptors. And the relatively cheap construction using stainless steel and just some expendable fairings, no big deal. Uh, you know, they could probably still do that mission for um, several million and not hundreds of millions, which uh, hasn't really been an option before at all. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, we talk about that again in our um, complete guide to Starship. We kind of talk about some of the potential options, including what, what I think would be uh, there, there might be an, ex, um, an expendable vehicle too so an expendable uh variant with the upper stage expendable upper stage variant so someday if necessary it's a pretty big if though that's that's a lot of mass <laughs> going places so uh thank you av perry uh chucka says it's six degrees celsius in oz at the moment colder than in new zealand i'm sure uh do really love low temps do really low temperatures have an effect on uh ground systems and launches um 
they shouldn't. I, that's something I don't really have data on. Um, of course, uh, you know, we can think back on something. I'm sure it varies vehicle to vehicle and system by system. Um, so I can't speak to every one of them. But of course, you know, the Challenger, again, uh, kind of showed flaws with with certain temperature considerations on the space shuttle. Um, that's not really, you know, again, each vehicle is different. So, um, yeah, I, I don't really know, to be honest, uh, what the considerations are. But you'd think if it gets colder and colder, it actually might be a little bit easier as far as uh, worrying about uh, the, the the boil off of the liquid oxygen um, or with Starship, for example, liquid oxygen and liquid methane, yeah, a little bit easier. You know, not much. That's that's still a, a large gap between minus 183 degrees Celsius and then, you know, going to, to up to six. Like, that's a big gap compared to, you know, 20 or whatever. But, um, yeah, it's it's I'm sure it's not a big deal. I don't know what happens if you get below freezing. And, I, again, like I said, it probably varies vehicle to vehicle. I'm sorry. I couldn't be more help for that one. Uh, Thomas, if Starship, the orbital ship, turns out to be too ambitious and complex, I don't think so, won't a more traditional upper stage still be way cheaper than SLS if the booster is reused? Yeah, we kind of touched on that a second ago, 100%. I mean, no questions asked. Um, you know, I, I really believe that these Starship prototypes that we're seeing flying are like 10 to 20 million. Uh, you know, we'd probably see a more refined version, and but probably more a cheaper version, you know, of, of just the upper stage. I think the upper stage could be could be made and flown for, you know, under 10 million. So if it had to be expended, it would still be not that much more expensive or similar cost to the upper stage of a Falcon 9. And that's saying something with an insanely like, I mean, especially if they're expending the upper stage and aren't don't have additional recovery hardware or additional margins for recovery at all. I'm sure that thing could launch 200, 300 metric tons to low Earth orbit. Um quite easily so that would be insane um so yeah if they if they had to do that it would it would be extremely competitive so all right this is from um uh nash uh not nash totes it oh man nash to itza okay what is the difference between the sea level and vacuum raptor engines why can't they use sea level raptors in orbit and vice versa very good question. Um, so uh, for that, I, I think I have to recommend a video called uh, "What Like Air Our." What was the? What did I end up naming it? Something about aerospikes. Everyday astronaut aerospikes. Aerospike engines. Um, so let me let me see if I can find the article version of this. Um, so let's start here. Uh, and I'll show you a couple of things. And then I'm also going to pull up before we even do this. I'll, I'll pull up um, sea level Raptor versus vacuum. Ooh. See, the clock has resumed and we are currently at T minus 17 minutes and counting. Ooh. Electron might be the rocket on the pad today, but recently we announced plans to build its much larger sibling, Neutron. While we wait for a new T0, let's take a look back at that announcement. Crap, what time is that? I'm so bad at this. Okay. Okay, yeah, so just, we'll watch this video while I'm doing math because it is awesome. When we say we're going to do something at Rocket Lab, <laughs> Give me a second. we do it. Not just once, but over and over again. The Electron rocket defined a number of industry firsts. First carbon fiber rocket to orbit, in fact. Somebody told me once that was going to be impossible. And it's reusable. But then there's the engines, the Rutherford rocket engine the very first 3D printed rocket engine ever to go into orbit. And in fact, also the very first electric pump cycle rocket engine ever produced. And of course, we didn't stop at rockets. We started building satellites too. Satellites to go to low Earth orbit, satellites to the moon, to Mars and Venus and beyond. And there's a lot more to come. But first, I've got to take care of some, some business here. There's a lot of things at Rocket Lab that we said we were going to do that we've done. And a few things at Rocket Lab that we said we would never do, which we have also done. So I really think with this project, it's about time I finally ate the hat. So if you guys haven't seen this, this is just too perfect. Uh, he said, you know, eating your hat is, is a, a phrase, if, for those of you that are unfamiliar with, with, that, uh, with that phrase, where it's like, you take back your words. So yeah, he quite literally ate a hat. Uh, this was their announcement for, for Neutron. Super cool. You have to watch this video on YouTube. Uh, but meanwhile, I want to. <laughs> That's I love that he did this. 
All right, so um, we're going to, so I'm, I'm going to try to find this this image here. Um, there we go. Okay, so the difference between sea level engine and the, okay, so look at this. This is the difference. The size is, is quite substantial. So the, the big the big deal here is the nozzle extension. So basically everything below um, this, this bendy tube thing that you can see, that's considered part of the nozzle extension. And... Um, and what that what that does is it is it allows the engine um, more time to lower the pressure of the exhaust. So what what happens is inside the combustion chamber, uh, the gas is, is at really high pressure, and, and in Raptor it can get up to almost three hundred bar, which is the highest um, operational. Hang on, I want to hear this quick. I miss. Oh, I missed it. <laughs> I don't know what they said, uh, but that is about the highest operating. Uh, operational rocket engine uh, combustion chamber pressure ever. And uh, what, what you do then is obviously you take that high pressure, uh, you you choke it down through the throat of the rocket engine. And when you choke it down, you, you get it to supersonic velocity. So um, obviously, you know, if you if you have to flow, if you're flowing a certain amount of of gas or, or you know, fluid through through anything, through, through a tube or whatever, if you want to flow the same amount of, of volume, the same amount of mass, uh, and you shrink the actual size of the opening, you have to speed up in order to do that. Think of a, you know, think of a highway or cars. If you want to take, say you have a, a thousand cars, you're trying to get them all across this bridge in one minute versus, uh, and you have say 10 lanes versus two. If you want to get those thousand cars across that bridge uh, in, in that minute and you have two lanes, you have to speed them way up to get all thousand across there, right? But if but if you have ten lanes, you could, you could they could all be crawling basically, and not crawling, but going relatively slowly. So what they do is yeah, they choke the flow at the, at the throat, and that's going to you know that's obviously it's still under very high pressure. But then from that point on, it is now supersonic, so it's faster than the speed of sound, and this is where a weird phenomena comes in, where as so in order to speed it up beyond that, you don't actually keep choking it. If you keep choking it, it just actually it just doesn't work. Uh, so what they end up doing is they if you widen the nozzle from that point out after this little converging point. Uh, what happens is you'll lower the pressure and you'll actually speed the gas up doing so. So you, you can get to the point where you know you're you're speeding the 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 flames and the the exhaust gas out that nozzle extremely extremely fast. The faster you get that gas, the more efficient the rocket engine is. Oh. And soon our operators will conduct another go no go poll after the hold. Let's listen into mission control and check how we're tracking for our second attempt of the day. We'll get back into the difference between sea level and vacuum in a second because it's it's a quite a quite a beefy topic to be talking about, honestly. Especially this early in the morning. <laughs> Especially this early in the morning. Well, hmm. I'll listen in here. I'll keep going on my rant. Uh, so, th so the the more you said, and that's considered your your. Well, here let, now let's go to, no, not this. Let's go to this. So I made a video about aerospike engines, and one of the cool things about aerospike engines is that they they uh, they can be used. You can use basically a vacuum optimized engine at sea level. And proceeding with the go no go pole for launch stage. Status go. Avionics. Avionics. Okay. GNC. GNC is go. Vicon. Vicon is go. T1. T1 is go. GC. GC is go. PLS. PLS is go. RSO. RSO is go. Met. Met is go. Mission management. Mission management is go. Recovery. Recovery is go. LD sub. LD sub go. Executive. Executives go. Go no go sequence complete. We're at T minus 11 minutes, 21 seconds and counting. We go for terminal count to T minus 10 minutes. From this point on, the three word whole procedure is in effect. Sweet. That is good news. GC, LD mission. LD GC. Proceed with sequence 50, bad terminal checks. Copy proceeding with sequence 50, bad terminal check. I do love those go no go polls. I wish that that was more common. I think that's super super cool. Okay, so uh, I'll take you away from the rocket for just one more second uh, and finish just kind of going through this. So 
Um, so you can't. The problem is, is obviously as you're lowering the pressure. Oh. Proceed with avionics thermal checks. Sequence fifty one. Proceeding with sequence fifty one. LDGZ on mission cord. Go. Stage one igniter pressure is verified. Hydraulic pressure is verified. S1 pre valve open. Pad terminal checks complete. Copy that. Sweet. Everything's sounding good. Okay, so uh, as you, again, as you straighten that flow and as you expand the nozzle out and make the nozzle longer and longer, you're lowering the pressure. Now, eventually, if you get to the point where you expand it too much, um, what will happen is the ambient air pressure will actually start to push in on that exhaust gas, kind of like this picture here, um, and it'll squeeze in and start to rip the actual flames stage from the walls the of the of the engine. Stage. And that's called flow separation. And if you have flow separation, you can actually destroy your nozzle. So you can't use a vacuum optimized bell nozzle at sea level. You can use a, a, a sea level engine in space, they just aren't as efficient. So the, the trade off here is you want your engine to be as efficient as possible. You want to expand that, that nozzle out as far as you can and still have it be operational at sea level. It's also not efficient to use um, an overexpanded engine. If you see, when you see those shock diamonds, those mock diamonds, um, where you see exhaust kind of going like this, that's actually a sign of inefficiency. They look really cool, but it's actually a sign of the, the nozzle being overexpanded. So uh, again, if you want to learn all about nozzle ex expansion uh, and all this stuff, definitely watch my video on aerospike engines. I promise you'll learn a decent amount um, about about flow separation and about uh, expansion ratios and vacuum optimizing sea, sea level engines, because uh, that's a loaded question, but it's a really, really good one. Stage one and stage two high voltage batteries ready for flight. And I think you'll learn something. All right. All right, Kimberly, uh, your daughter would love to know where I got the Saturn V model. That's actually the Lego Saturn V model. So that's made out of Legos, believe All it or not. All engine blips are nominal. All engines are ready. The stage terminal checks are complete. Copy that stage. Cool. It's looking good. I like this. I hope I hope this thing goes off this morning. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I it, not this morning. Maybe later in the weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, by the way, I don't think I don't know if that's a siren or if that was a a, uh, a pump whining that you just heard. If you could kind of hear that that high pitch noise. Um, Thank you very much from uh, Kiwi Chris Morton. Let's see, Kevin, um, he says, uh, Rosalind Franklin Rover will land uh, atop a Russian carrier lander. If it lands successfully, it'll be the first operational Russian Mars lander. Yes, that sounds right. That is very cool. I hope that that works out. I want, I want more vehicles exploring uh, Mars and getting us more data, and, and not less, of course. It's not a competition. It's, a, it's expanding Avionics humanity's LD knowledge. Proceed with sequence 54, AFDS enable for flight. AFTS is the automatic flight termination system. So if they if the rocket were to stray off course and start heading towards Auckland or something, then they uh, then uh, the AFTS, the automatic flight termination system, actually will take care of that itself. AFTS is green and enabled for flight. There we go. It's enabled for Copy. flight. But an old traditional flight termination FTS um, was a, a manual a manual system that had to be uh, looked at by a, a range operator. So and watched over so let's see this is musical wolves uh, starship vertical due to crane lift uh, attachment is on both side of starship and would be better to not mess with the flaps and lawn runs yeah I, I, that's a, another point too uh, you know uh, like we kind of said at this point the rocket is just always in a vertical orientation um, starship is so it just kind of makes sense to keep it vertical on the way out to the bed so all right um Let's see. This is from uh, Plush Vader. Thank you so much for becoming a member. Um, for the from for, uh, in Discord, yes, I will always be behind the official stream because this is, of course, we're taking their stream and and uh, and restreaming it. So we'll always be behind the official stream. Um, unlike when we're doing Starship streams out in Boca Chica, and I have cameras uh, out there. You know, we do our own production out there. 
Uh, that's different because we actually have a direct pipe there. Go. We're not restreaming anything, and we're 10 to 20 seconds to ahead of SpaceX Coffee. for those. But with this, with these old launches, I'll always be behind because I'm watching it first, restreaming it for you guys. So, yep. Recovery LD mission. Nothing I can do there. Go ahead. Uh, proceed. Confirm recovery as goes a green. Affirmative. That's good. And monitor them from the airport. Affirmative. Avionics LD mission. Go ahead. Proceed with sequence 55. Enable recovery systems of flight. Proceeding with sequence 55. All right. Um, why does the dry mass? We are at oh. T minus four minutes and 42 seconds and counting. The strong back has been retracted for flight and those upper level winds are currently playing ball. From here on out, we'll listen into mission control as they proceed to T zero. It's a really good question here from Thomas. Um, says, why does the dry mass of the different stages All impact? the missions, LD. From this point on, there should be no red flags in the critical LCCs. Okay, so they're still going for it. Uh, all right, so uh, let's try and get back to that question. Um, so uh, the dry mass of the different stages. So the, the reason is, so if you attach, say, a kilogram to the upper stage, uh, since that upper stage gets into orbit and literally that one kilogram would be with the vehicle all the way into orbit, you would then remove a kilogram of your payload uh, potential. So say you're trying to add, um, you know, a, a, a parachute or something to recover something that that 100 kilograms of parachute would detract from your 100 kilograms of payload mass because it's going to orbit. It's, it's riding along with the payload the whole entire way. Now, the first stage, because it only makes up about a quarter of the velocity, uh, it only takes about a quarter of the payload mass. It's not do it does it only does about a quarter of the work. Oh, copy that avionics. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the the first stage again. Uh, just just to reiterate, uh, it only does about a quarter of the work to get into orbit. Oh, you can confirm flight computer as goes a green. All as goes green. Lock auto sequence and confirm. Auto sequence locked. All stations, we go for auto sequence start at T minus two minutes. At this time, LDs go for launch. Okay. If they get down to T minus two minutes, that will be the official uh, that the vehicle is in the auto start sequence at that point. So hopefully, we're a little bit further, I think, than we were the last attempt earlier this morning so those of you tuning in now you're lucky because you missed a, a, a decent wait here about an hour wait so okay let's hear them call it these are on tunnel pal okay all stage power is disabled it was on internal power that's good. All right, they're going for it. They are going for it. Now, of course, it could still scrub at some point if they if they have a violation in weather or range, uh, or if there's a, a vehicle issue or something that, that could still scrub. Box load complete, system in re recirculation. Yep, so the, the liquid oxygen is loaded up. So you'll now see it kind of bleeding out of, uh, of some of the extra orifices there and, and as it continues to warm up. Um, but yeah, so okay, so the, yeah, the first stage just doesn't do as much work to get a vehicle into orbit. It kind of gets it mostly out of the atmosphere and injects about a, you know, a fifth or a quarter of the amount of orbital velocity. But because it only injects about a, you know, a twenty-five percent of the velocity, disabled. Um, if you attach a kilogram to that, it only takes off about, you know, a quarter of a kilogram. So, um, yeah, it's just about the amount of work that the stages are doing is why it affects the payload capacity differently. Hopefully, that helped answer your question. 
uh, from Caesar. Why doesn't SpaceX have a railway system between the launch and build sites? I well, in the United States, um, they could probably go by rail. Um, stage one and stage two licks, tanks are pressed. Okay, I'm just going to listen in here. But Boca Chica, maybe that would make sense. Maybe that would make sense out of Boca Deluge Chica. activated. Okay, guys, we're getting close. Two minus 20 and counting. Two minus 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. <laughs> Plus 30 Stage seconds into the mission, the Electron is well on its way to space after its 20th liftoff from the pad at Rocket Lab Launch Complex 1. We had a great view from the tracking cameras of Entering the power of those Rutherford engines, mode. with Electron clearing past 700, sorry, it's clearing well on its way to space right now. And very soon, Electron will approach max Q, or maximum aerodynamic pressure. And this is the moment when the forces against the launch vehicle are at their peak during ascent. So let's listen in the for the call that sunny. Electron has cleared that you gate. Run one. So they'd have the best audio, that's for sure. Might have been a little bit loud. <laughs> I apologize if you're now deaf. But, oh, that is some of the Rocket best XQ. rocket audio in the business. By far. Discharge. I love that. Max-Q cleared. Train ship on There's the call out. Electron has successfully passed through Max Q with propulsion continuing nominally. In about a minute, we'll be coming up to three events that happen back to back during flight. First is Wait, main is engine cutoff or MECO. This is when the nine Rutherford engines on Electron's booster throttle hey, down before station. shutting off completely to slow the rocket down before the second event. That's when the first stage separates from the rest of Electron as it continues with the third event, ignition of the sole Rutherford engine that powers Electron and the satellites to orbit. With that stage separation, Electron's booster begins its journey back to Earth and so will begin our second Electron recovery attempt. We'll hopefully have a live camera feed on that first stage to watch that descent take place. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's Please wait for the call out for those three events. That's awesome. Stage one propulsion is nominal. So hopefully we'll get video feed as they try to recover the first stage. That is awesome. And Miko confirmed. Successful separation. Stage technician. Recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Analyst recovery. Proceed with sequence 59. Stage one recovery operations. Confusing meetings on. As you've seen, we've had a successful Miko and stage separate. No, there's been no ignition, sorry, but on your screen, uh, we'll keep that view and see what we can come back to you with soon. Oh, that's not good. Oh, no. No. So the upper stage did not light, and that is absolutely necessary to get things into orbit. Oh, I wonder what this even does for the recovery operations, because now there's a second stage coming down uncontrollably alongside basically the first stage. So I wonder if they're going to have to terminate the upper stage for range safety, because they can't have a, an upper stage falling back towards uh, you know, a recovery crew that is out there uh, waiting to, to be near the first stage, so this could even be bad for okay, the so recovery. Okay, so it looks like we've had a loss of telemetry. Uh, we'll come back to you with more information as soon as we have it.
Man. That, wow. Did not see that coming. Don't forget, guys, the uh, you know the Falcon 9 also lost two upper stages. Um, had you know The upper stage is hard. Uh, the Falcon 9 had lost uh, an upper stage while sitting on the pad for Amos 6, and had lost an upper stage for CRS 7 um, on Ascent. Uh, this is different. You know, the Electron has obviously, they, they lost, uh, they had an upper stage uh, not make it into orbit one time. Uh, I think it was for Flight 13, if I remember right. I, I, of course, it happened to be 13. Um, so this, you know, the good thing is these vehicles are wired up with so much data. There is just data galore on these things. Now, I, I don't think there's anything that we can tell here, but I, I did notice when they went for stage, uh, for, I, I couldn't believe how rapidly that, that booster got kind of pushed out of the way. That was a really cool shot at stage separation, but I'm curious what they're, what they're thinking right now. Did they, did they have to terminate the? The upper stage. And if they have to terminate the upper stage. Man. Hmm, man. To my friends at Rocket Lab, I am sorry. That is not how any of us thought this mission was going to go today. I'm tempted to go back and look at look it and see if we can see anything, but I, I don't want to miss out. Maybe what I'll do is I'll put their stream up, um, just so I don't miss anything live. I'll have that up on another window. And um, give me one second here, guys. And then we're gonna we are gonna look back at what, what if see if there was anything that we could, you know, pick up on. Of course, you know, we we don't want to speculate, um, on anything, but but it is okay. Let's see here. Let's see if there happens to be anything that for the call out for those three events. Happen, you know, if there happened to be anything that we can see that's unusual. That I mean, obviously there's a latency difference control. between. We are experiencing a telemetry issue with today's mission, and therefore do not have live views of the vehicle to bring you at this time. So we're going to end today's webcast and bring you updates via our social media channels. Thank you for tuning in to today's mission. We'll see you back here soon. No, hold on. This is. Give me one second, guys. Um. I hope we don't lose this playback option. Give me one second. I will. T so they are ending their live broadcast. Um, let me make sure that I've got something here for you guys. One second here. Um, okay. What's the best way for me to do this? I'm going to go like this. Go full screen on this. And we are, for some reason, the playback had lost on my other screen. So we're going to take a look here at some of the stuff that we see. Uh, again, to our friends at Rocket Lab, hang in there. I'm, I I have no doubt you're going to learn from this. Um, we're all <laughs> as as shocked as you are. I'm sure quite right now. I'm sure. Well, I'm sure we're more shocked than we are. But uh, yeah, we feel for you. Of course, we're here to you know continue to, to cheer you on and support you guys uh, in, in everything you're working on. We're obviously all huge fans of aerospace, and and all of us here at Team Space know that things don't always go right. And I hate have I've only had to give the speech like a couple times here on air. It's, it's hard. You know, th these rockets are, are pushing the very, the very bleeding edge of what's physically possible. Um, so it's, yeah. Um, I better put a, a little note here that, um, mission lost. That's a hard one to have to put up on screen. Okay. So let's get you guys into the playback. Um, See if we can figure anything out, but man, ah, that sucks. Okay, again, uh, just I, I do ask uh, all of us here, if you're watching my stream, to be respectful. Uh, this is you know people's work and and lives, you know, where they are are working their butts off for this stuff. Uh, so it's not easy for them, you know. It, it, we, let's make sure we have some empathy on the situation. That this is not good news. This is not something, uh, you know, that we. It, it's just. It, it sucks. It sucks. I did not see that happening. So, okay, stage separation. Now, notice there is a latency between the cameras. That's not a. That's not telling of anything. So, actually, what you're seeing on the left screen right here is the video feed from the upper stage, and the feed from the booster looks like it's delayed because that shot on the right is looking up 
No, that's also an upper stage shot. Actually, that's also an upper stage shot. That's another camera, which is interesting that they were. Oh, oh, the left one. Sorry, the left one. Let me see that is okay. Oh, sorry. I had it backwards. Left one is from the booster looking up at the upper stage. Um, and the right camera is from the upper stage looking back down at the booster. So there's some latency difference between those two. Um, that makes sense. That's ignition there. Whoa. And it just veered off immediately. So remember we watched that feed before. Now, I do want to point out, although from our vantage point there, it does look like the, the upper stage veers off dramatically. It's not unusual that when you light up the engine, the exhaust can interact with the, the stage, the, the first stage, and actually flip it. So some of that could be the stage getting kind of turned and turned away from the, the upper stage. Uh, that would not be unusual. We've seen that before. And, you know, when you'd see some of these, these stage separation shots, when the engine lights up, like on the Falcon one, for instance, I have this vivid memory of, you know, Falcon one flight four where the booster lights and it, it, or the, when the upper stage lights and it pushes the, the booster away. So if you were inside the booster, you would see from your vantage point, you would see the upper stage veer off suddenly. Um, but that was, I don't know. I don't have. I mean, it looks like it. And then the stage is shut down. As you've seen, we've had a successful Miko and stage super. No, there's been no ignition. As you've seen, we've. Yeah, let's let's go frame by frame here. See if we can see, you know, anything of any significance. Again, I don't want to be armchair engineer here and just sit here and pretend like we know anything that's happening. But, of course, there are some things that we can see from uh, from some frames. I mean, at this point, the stage would have to be relatively motionless, the first stage. I wonder if we have any other frame of reference. We probably don't have, like, a, a star in the sky that we could see as a frame of reference if this is a daytime launch, maybe we'd have something to look at here besides just the stage. But because that's so overexposed in the camera, you can't see anything else. You know, that will wash out any other visible data. Veering off like that is not, probably not great, <laughs> obviously. Oh, man. Well, I think, honestly, that's as far as speculation land goes, guys. I don't want to go beyond saying it looks like from the visual data that it appeared to go off course and uh if that's the case the flight termination system would have cut the engine um and maybe wouldn't have even terminate it but i i have a bad feeling that that also means they would have to terminate the booster as well uh, again uh, the the upper stage and potentially the booster so the recovery efforts um probably are are yeah um oh did they did was there actually a telemetry blip too hang on let me Hang on. So we can get a sense here. Okay, so let's make sure the telemetry, because telemetry is, is sometimes a little bit behind. Engines on Electron's booster throttle down before shutting off completely to slow the rocket down before the second and third event. Ignition of stage separate electron. Okay, so. Let's make sure we know when it, okay, so it, it's right there. Okay, so that's normal. The The speed will drop after booster separation because, you know, or at, at when booster, when the main engine cut off, when the engine's cut off, uh, the, the vehicle's basically coasting uphill. So gravity is pulling back down on it still. It continues to pull at 1G, all slightly less than 1G because it's uh, a little bit higher in altitude, but still mostly pretty much for all intents and purposes, it's still being pulled with one G of, of, of force downwards towards earth. So that will slow the vehicle down. That's normal. Uh, and then, uh, at, so I'm just kind of paying attention to that number 60. So 82, that's normal, normal, normal. And stage separation, it goes up to eight and then right back down. Kind of goes all over the place. Kind of goes all over the place, it, which almost makes it seem like it, it is spinning. 
again, uh, oh, you guys can't see that right now. Let me make sure that's not covered up. My bad. <laughs> One second here. Um, so, one second here. My bad. Sorry, guys. So, yeah, so the velocity is dropping. Okay, now watch velocity. It kind of goes all over the place between about 8,200 down to 8,150, 8,100, 82. Kind of. Yeah, we're just going to say that that's not good. Um, Again, I, I don't want to just sit here and, and pretend like we, we have an answer. We'll, we'll get an answer from Rocket Lab. Um, but I do want to – we have a, a couple more people. I, I want to get off air here and, and just go back to bed, <laughs> wallow in, in bed in sadness until we get uh, some official word from, from Rocket Lab. So I got to get through some of you guys' uh, some questions. So um, – uh, from Nicholas, I love your videos referring to the earlier questions. Uh, cold welding is the issue that bare metals touching in a, in a vacuum can spontaneously fuse together. Interesting, huh? I don't know. I I don't know how you you deal with that or how you mitigate it, and how specifically how Starship will 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 deal with that or or what issues it might have uh, in particular. But yeah, thank you very much for that that knowledge, there, Nicholas. I do appreciate that. Um. Yeah. Let's keep going here. Uh Kesta, you're you're welcome. Thanks for thanks for tuning in. Sorry that it wasn't uh what we wanted to see this morning, unfortunately. So um X Team Official. Uh do I live near Starbase or do I do I fly there? Um I have a studio space down near Star near, near Starbase and I also have a studio up in Iowa. So um yeah, I've I drive or fly i've flown once now down to down to starbase and i've i've driven the rest of the time but uh the cool thing is now i don't have to worry about hotels and stuff as much um i can kind of just go down there keep everything set up in the studio and go live when there's going to be a thing and no big deal don't have to take gear back and forth across the country so uh all right uh so chance of nasa using artemis 2 for lunar uh using artemis 2 for lunar starship uh, stainless demo wait demo one for lunar uh so i think you're confusing a couple things artemis 2 will be will be sls carrying the orion capsule sls will not be launching starship uh, or, or the lunar lander the hls the lunar lander system that will be launched on super heavy it'll be a separate launch the entire super heavy uh and and the starship lunar lander will meet artemis and the artem and the orion capsule um, up in lunar orbit. So those are two like SLS and SLS and Starship will never meet in space. Orion and Starship will meet, but there is no mating or no, nothing to do with Starship and SLS. So just to just to clarify that, because uh, chance of NASA using Artemis two for lunar Starship demo. Um, oh, I, unless you're just talking about like using no, there, there's zero chance for that. Um, there there will be an uncrewed version first. Uh, going down to the moon for Starship, but they, they won't get crew on, on it until at least Artemis 3. So, um, yeah. All right. Um, didn't SpaceX want to use hot gas thrusters on Starship at, at one point, but doesn't that require the engines to be on? Thanks for what you do, Tim. We really love your work. Well, thank you so much, Taylor. Um, No. So hot gas thrusters just mean, it doesn't mean hot, like, engine temperature hot. You know, we, we think of hot as, as that. Um, the, what they can do is they can take some of the the when the engines are running, take what are cryogenic propellants in the engines. And as they boil off, take some of that boil off, store though that boiled off gaseous methane or an, and gaseous oxygen in uh, COPVs and separate COPV tanks that are high pressure. So you can keep those, you know, limited quantities under very high pressure. Of course, you don't want the whole vehicle to be under high pressure because you have to have really thick and heavy tanks. But for smaller quantities, you know, you keep those in COPVs and those composite overwrapped pressure vessels. And uh, yeah, they what they can do there is they can just take those hot gases, the, the hot gas or hot well, just gaseous methane and gaseous liquid oxygen that are under already under high pressure, and just put those into a combustion chamber uh, for gas thrusters, and it'll be uh, more efficient than a cold gas thruster, uh, and still relatively efficient. So yeah. Uh, a good relevant question to what just happened from HG Tech. Uh, do they have to pay the customer back when they fail? Um, they likely will just refly. There's actually insurance on these things, and there is, uh, and they'll have to refly, and the, there will be some financial loss. So, 
Yeah. Um, thank you so much, PK. Unfortunately, the emoji of a pair riding a firework and disappearing before bursting into the sky. It's a little bit true. A uh, little bit true. <laughs> Bryce. Um, yeah. Thank you. Unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, from Janeth, do you think the reusability of Falcon 9 booster is negated by the recovery fleet costs? Looking forward to more educational videos. No, I don't think so. I don't think at all. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't do it. There's no incentive for for SpaceX to to do anything at a loss, right? If um, if it costs more to recover the booster than it is to make a new one, they would absolutely not recover it. Um, so clearly they're saving money and they clearly there's enough cost savings even for rocket lab with a tiny little launch vehicle that they, they can only sell for, you know, five million dollars per ride or so. There's still enough margin for them to want to go out and try to fly a freaking helicopter and and, a, and another recovery vessel um, for their little rocket. Right. So there's it, it must only cost, we'll say, a million dollars. Right. And that booster must cost two million dollars. Um, to or, or let's say the let's say the booster costs a million dollars. I guess Rocket Lab's big thing they don't necessarily talk about cost savings. They they more talk about uh, manufacturing. They don't want to make new stages over and over. Um, so so for, the, for Rocket Lab maybe it is a, a tie. Maybe it's a break even point. Um, and it's not necessarily a financial gain. But I think there's a lot more margin on a Falcon Nine that likely costs you know twenty million dollars or something. So yeah. Uh, Nike Oak advanced congratulations for 1 million. Thank you so much. Hopefully it should be in like the next two weeks or so. I have no idea, but when it does that basically soon after a million, I will be doing that million live stream that, that charity fundraiser and I'll be playing some Kerbal space program. So hopefully you guys can come join me and hang out and hopefully you don't mind a little Kerbal, uh, from Alex. How do you know, uh, when rocket labs slash SpaceX are going to launch? Well, we have, uh, everydayastronaut.com. Uh, you can go to upcoming launches. You can see upcoming rocket launches. There's also, I really like, um, the app next space flight. Um, yeah, that's, it's an awesome app. It was, it was originally, uh, made by Michael Baylor for, with NASA space flight. Uh, yeah. Next space flight is awesome. That's a very, very good app. Um, yeah. So thank you very much, Alex harvester of sorrow. Uh, it kind of looked like second stage lit had a spin. Yeah, I know. Uh, does the, the, the flight termination system on second stage also trigger the booster to also fly? That, that's a good question. I don't know the details on that. I hope we, we do learn a little bit more. Um, yeah, I hope we learn a little more very soon. Uh, ben Sanford. Hey, Tim. Uh, wish, it, uh, wish it were more. Keep Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sean tumbling would be one <laughs> hell of a ride. Sign me up. No, thank you. Uh, you'll be burning up on reentry big time. And from CG in space, thank you so much for your membership, guys. I'm gonna get to bed. Uh, yeah, I b have barely slept, and now I'll probably barely sleep just because I'll be wired up thinking about this stuff um, a little bit too much as well. Oh, again, sorry to Rocket Lab, man. I, I yeah. Oh, oh. I keep meaning uh, something important for you guys. People have been asking about this a ton. I am really excited to, to announce that the full flow stage combustion cycle hoodies are finally back in stock after like four months. We had a supply chain issue as half the world has supply chain issues right now. Uh, so if you guys want, uh, those of you that have been waiting for the full flow stage combustion cycle hoodie to come back in stock, it is back in stock. Uh, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Click around, find some stuff. I'm so glad that it is back in stock because that is one that you guys have been waiting for for a long time. So yeah, if you guys want to help support what I do, consider uh, going and getting some cool stuff for yourself. We, we saw just, a, I just saw a Forbes article the other day again with Elon wearing the full flow stage combustion cycle shirt. Uh, yeah, if you guys want to help support what I do and get some cool stuff for yourself, go to everydayastronaut.com slash shop and uh, check on, click on some cool stuff and, and shop around and that helps support me. And it helps you look cool too while well, supporting me. So uh, thanks, you guys, for tuning in again. Um, our thoughts are with the Rocket Lab crew and also the Black Sky crew with their with their satellites. Hopefully it isn't a huge setback for them. And hopefully everything gets back on track and Rocket Lab learns to make a even uh, more reliable vehicle from this point on with all that new data. Um, of course, failure uh, can teach you things that, that you didn't know were, were problems beforehand. So I'm sure they'll get it figured out. I have all the faith in the world. So, uh, yeah, no problem. The, the, we, they got this. You know, Rocket Lab, no big deal. Uh, we expect to see you back uh, back at it here relatively soon. So, 
All right, guys, I think that's going to do it for me. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Goodbye, everybody.